Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's native landscaping webinar with Bob Hendrickson. We're just going to give people a minute or two to log in and um, then we'll get started. Hope everyone's having a good night, escaping the heat. Seems like people have nothing better to do tonight, so that's good. Yeah. Just give people a few more seconds. Okay. So hi everyone, welcome to our webinar. My name is Carissa Englert and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving with Conservation Nebraska's Common Ground Program. And I just wanna thank you all so much for being here and attending the last part in our Native Landscaping webinar series. Tonight, um, we hope to learn more about savanna, woodland, and prairie plants, starting with woodland and prairie, and then maybe going back to savanna plants later, if we have enough time. Um, a couple reminders for you before we get started. Everyone is muted and your cameras are off, so you can't be seen or heard. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can feel free to just type them into the Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll go over them at the end. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded, so if you do miss anything, it will be posted on our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in a couple weeks. And lastly, towards the end, there will be a short poll that will pop up on your screen with a couple questions, and these just help Conservation Nebraska to improve our future webinars and events. Here with us tonight is Bob Hendrickson, and he is going to share a little bit about himself and his work, and then we will get started with the webinar. So I'll hand it over to you, right. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, folks, how you doing tonight? Uh, uh, did you get any rain? Yeah, right. There's a broken record for you. Well, uh, we're in the midst of this big time drought, and thankfully, we're going to be talking about plants that could take that drought tonight. Hi, I'm Bob Hendrickson. I'm with the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. We plant Nebraska each and every day. Uh, you can go to plantnebraska.org for some great uh, examples, ideas, lots of lots of lists of plants, you know. Um, we're kind of uh, known for promoting native plants. And uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, um, there's lots of great resources for you there uh, to learn more about native plants and, and good lists from where to start from. Uh, and and then you're going to make this uh, PowerPoint available to people, right, Krissa, I believe, uh, at some point here. And so we actually met up last week and she got the PowerPoints. They're too darn large to share. <laughs> so, so we met up so she could download it. Um, yeah, and so if you know me, I never finish, right? Because plants, you'll never finish learning. And I think that's what should turn us all on about horticulture, right? That's why you're turning in tonight because it's a never ending process, right? Lifelong learning. And that's that's the beauty of plants. And that's what really keeps me going. And, and uh, guess what? They're important too, right? So um, made it to Nebraska City this morning to give a talk at Grimm's Gardens. It's a local nursery that has a, what they call it, um, dirt gab or something like that where they get together and just talk about gardening there over coffee at the nursery i think that's a cool idea so they invited me there to talk about uh, pollinators so that was kind of fun and uh yeah so uh so from nebraska city to here and then and then 10 days ago out in shadron giving a talk at shadron state park so it's kind of fun getting all over nebraska um here at the statewide arboretum of course you you lovers of the western part of the state have you ever been to ash hollow um, out here, Windless Hill there uh, in Western Nebraska, one of my favorite places to visit on my way out to the Panhandle. So that's what the view you're seeing behind me. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen, okay? And we'll get this oh, maybe good. underway. Come on, Bob. There we go. Whoop. I only see you and I. Why don't I see my... Oh, um, you're not seeing your presentation? No. Well, I'm seeing it, but you and I are in the way. <laughs> oh. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to make that smaller. I'm going to try this. And I'm just going to move it over here. There, we got this. Okay, perfect. Okay. I'm assuming, whoops, I'm assuming everybody else can see it though, right? Uh, all right, folks, do you recognize that picture? Can anybody tell me where I'm at with that picture? I want you to guess. And guess what? It's in Nebraska. So if you're naughty enough to not visit Indian Cave State Park yet, shame on you. Put that on your bucket list to visit Indian Cave State Park. Obviously, a 
great thing to visit in the spring, but man, the fall color will kind of bring you uh, to the kind of that stepping stone of the Appalachians, right? It kind of gives you that Eastern view and, and uh, we're seeing lots of oaks in this picture here. Probably it looks like some red oak there bark in front of me. So yeah, Indian Cave State Park. So what I wanted to do is start out about some of our native plants for dappled shade, because uh, a lot of us are dealing with shade trees in Lincoln, right? We don't have wall-to-wall -wall sunshine, and I'm definitely one of those people. We have a lot of trees around our place, so I really don't have a lot of space for your full sun native plants. So I thought so I would, if I would get started with the dappled uh, shade, the, the shade lovers, the woodland species, uh, then, I, then I'm going to swing back to where we left off with the last presentation with milkweeds. So bear with me as we go through uh, dappled shade. And what I'm after, not only for you to garden with, with native plants, but also reduce mowing. Because mowing underneath your trees, guess what that leads to? Compacted soil. Trees don't like compacted soil because when it rains, it all runs off your lawn, right? It all runs into the gutter, even on your lawn. Research has shown even a, a compacted lawn is almost like almost like concrete when it comes to absorb, absorbing rainfall. It just doesn't do a very good job because we're mowing it once a week. So I have areas in my yard where I haven't mowed, watered, raked, or um, yeah, mowed, watered, and raked. Those three things I don't like doing. <laughs> and I don't know about you as a gardener, but uh, I just don't like doing them. And so I made a decision probably around 15 years ago not to set up a sprinkler anymore anywhere in my yard, except for the vegetables, maybe. And then maybe establishing new plants, uh, like a new garden. I'll set up a sprinkler as a temporary thing for establishment. Otherwise, they're on their own. Uh, because uh, if I continue watering, then I never know who can make it without that exterior irrigation. And because I let the leaves fall where they may, uh, it creates its own mulch. So I'll show you ways to do this now. Look at this lawn alternative ugly scene. Isn't that horrible? No, I'm just kidding. I think it's pretty sweet, right? And you might uh, figure if you know Bob, you know he's a big fan of sedges. And I'm, I, I wanted to get really put sedges on the map, our native sedges. And we you can call it a sedge meadow uh, rather than, well, it looks to me like you're lazy and you just didn't want to mow, right? Well, no, these are meadows we're creating, right? And here you see, this is called Texas sedge. And you might be saying, well, Texas sedge, will that grow here? Yes, it will, because Texas sedge, its native range comes up into Nebraska. So it's a native plant, even though it's named after the state of Texas, right? Nice, fine uh, texture to it, right? As you can see, very tough, very drought tolerant, no, doesn't need help from you. And if you want some pizzazz in the garden like this, you could always put bulbs in between those clumps because they grow as clumps. So there's space in between the plants that could have crocus, daffodils, tulips, uh, species tulips. It could have woodland poppies. It could have columbines. It could have woodland flocks, anything, anything you desire in between those clumps, right? They're a smart choice for dry, shady areas. They can handle the shade and competition for tree roots much better than bluegrass or fescue lawns ever will. And then uh, this picture, you can see the, the leaves as, as the mulch. So that's, as the leaves fall off the tree, uh, they just kind of work their way in between those clumps and the, the sedge comes right up through those leaves in the spring. You don't have to rake the leaves out of there, mow it back. They just come right through the old growth. So I like them because they add just that form, texture, and color to those uh, shady areas in the landscape. And this is kind of one taken to the stream in a park setting. And so my dream is uh, Lincoln's park systems is crowded with trees and where we have trees, we have sedge meadows so they can put away those $12,000 mowers uh, or maybe they're up to 15 by now. And then you have to hire employees that do nothing but mow all summer. How about having employees go in there and take care of, oh, well, we can't do this with the maintenance. Uh, it's gonna be too weedy. Well, have them get off the mower. It is possible to get off a mower. And, and get rid of, say, a sucker tree, a, a hackberry or something seeds itself in there. Sure, you still have to do some maintenance, but it's very, very low maintenance because the plant is uh, providing that competition, if you will. If the ground is covered, seeds don't germinate as easy, right? So here it is, very modern European style using native sedges as the base, but then putting in very familiar flowers so your neighbors go, oh, I see they're not lazy, you know? 
and not mowing, right? And then you can have these sedge meadows and these shady areas to kind of be bordered by maybe like a mulched area, as you see on the right of the screen or next to a sidewalk where, you know, it's purposeful design, right? And the neighbors can see that, that it's, and again, this could be wildflowers in the front or whatever uh, in the front of those uh, sedges here on the edge of those wood chips, right? It could be, heck, put hosses in there. I don't care. The I, the plan for me, again, is so the leaves that fall off the trees remain on your yard without you having to rake. And I'm telling you, they come right up through the leaves. And two, so you don't ever have to water this space again. Uh, the sedges work in concert with the the uh, roots of the trees uh, rather than against them they work together um, connecting their root systems isn't that cool I think it's cool so picture Lincoln's parks right or any park USA with more like this style uh, than not and uh, I think it's the wave of the future especially as we deal with what are we going to do about climate change right well here's the simple simple solution we can all do it at our own home landscapes and last time I checked turf grass doesn't like growing underneath trees anyway and I've seen people try to regrow and regrow grass underneath there. It just doesn't like it. And I'm telling you, these sedges, even during this extreme drought we're experiencing right now, are laughing at the drought. Um, I'm seeing no signs of stress on the plants. I'm seeing no signs of browning tips or anything like that. They're shrugging their shoulders and saying, bring it on. So woodland sedges are easy to grow, adaptable to soil types, drought tolerant, they're functional, but ornamentally appropriate as well, in my opinion. So there you see they're growing in clumps, allowing space for fallen leaves to remain, nature's mulch rather than hiring some company to come in and put down uh, chopped up trees, which is fine. A wood chip mulch is fine. I'm just saying utilize those leaves because they're free. And uh, they eliminate or greatly reduce the need for raking leaves, which is huge. And returning that those nutrients to the soil in the drip line of that tree is going to ensure, how do I ensure my big healthy tree is going to be here for the long haul, right? What can I do in my landscape to make sure that tree's fat and happy, I call it, right? Well, do more like a sedge meadow and you'll have that. Here's oak sedge, uh, a nice little species native to Nebraska, fine clumper. Um, there you see uh, it planted in the landscape. Uh, actually, that's my red oak there when I was just starting to do this with my sedge meadow. And there you can see uh, oak sedge's native range. It just gets into the eastern part of the state. Those lighter green um, boxes or counties, if you will, are where it's been documented in Nebraska. So basically following the Missouri corridor, mainly as an upland sedge, uh, the Lus Hills and the upland areas in dry, dry shade. Appalachian sedge is one I'm falling in love with, not native to Nebraska, obviously with a name like that. It's an eastern species, but very similar, uh, tough as nails, uh, good, good sedge. And again, for the designer in you, how to create different gardens using sedges, I think the creativity is just awesome, right? You can do so many different things. You can see what this homeowner did with Appalachian sedge and the plant you're seeing in here behind it. Uh, this guy is an Amsonia or a Blue Star. So very nice combination together there, I think. All right. Uh, and then bristle leaf sedge. Wow. Uh, one of my favorites. This is actually my home landscape. Gosh, this picture is probably, I don't know, 15 years old. Uh, bristle leaf sedge, probably the tiniest of the native woodland sedges. Only about, oh, the leaves here that you're seeing are only about three inches tall. And these uh, cute little dainty flowers coming up above it are maybe five, six inches total. This is epimedium, a really nice shade plant behind it. Of course, daffodils. And I think I got more epimedium. There's some back here is some bleeding hearts. So they work really well with your woodland uh, uh, shade plants, right? They look great with hostas because hostas take their time emerging in the spring. These guys green up very early. I mean, they're almost semi-evergreen. They will start greening up, I kid you not, in early March. And I, they really can tolerate part shade too. They Dense shade, they, they kind of sometimes can just sit there. But if you give them a little morning sun or afternoon sun, maybe 50% sun, they really shine. But uh, this is a lady's place in Omaha who sent me this picture because I talked her into as she was looking for some ground covers for her shade, I talked her into doing sedges and she has since fallen in love with them. And this is Pennsylvania sedge. Uh, I really like this picture, first of all, for the fence they created, but look what they did. They have wood chip mulch everywhere. And as you can see with these shade trees, 
it's dense shade, right? And so rather than trying to go lawn, <laughs> they eliminated the lawn, just did wood chip uh, walking things and then put um, Pennsylvania sedge in the square inside and, you know, highlight it with the bird bath. Of course, they put plants in it, but it is what it is. But Pennsylvania sedge is a what we call a runner. What you've been seeing with these are what we call clumpers, right? They grow in clumps and maybe 12 by 12 inch clump you're looking at there. And, and then whereas this plant is rhizominous, it will slowly but surely spread. And it's a great, great lawn alternative, like one of the best. And you can see again, Pennsylvania sedge is native to the east, but it makes it all the way to, uh, gosh, I wanna say Western Iowa. Uh, certainly it makes it to Iowa and Missouri, um, right on the edge of Nebraska. So close enough, right? For native standards, really fine texture, um, gorgeous plant, um, overlooked and underutilized. And there you see the interesting, uh, uh, flowers in the spring. And again, creativity is uh, at your dispense when you're using this plant. So here's kind of a slope in a pretty sunny area. I've seen this plant planted in full sun and I've seen it planted in full shade. And it says, bring it on. Um, it can get a little burned uh, late summer, you know, July, August with heat without being irrigated because it's a woodland species. But um, the Assurity Life Building here in Lincoln down there by uh, 21st and P there by the Hub Cafe. They have a lot of Pennsylvania sedge in their landscape. If you want to go view it and see how they they have masted in there to make it look like a, a stream, a green stream running through a landscape of bushes. Really cool effect there. So I encourage you to, to make it down there. Uh, maybe, maybe you'll make it to Hub and Soul, the concert series, right? <laughs> if you're in Lincoln, I apologize for those that aren't. Anyway, all right, Carrick's Rosea, the uh, the uh, curly styled wood sedge, also called rosy sedge, even though there's nothing rosy about it. It's not red, you know, seed heads aren't red, but it, again, you see very similar in growth habit, uh, tough as nails. Um, and then one of my favorites, what got me started on all this uh, sedge stuff, we have 60 species native to Nebraska folks, and most of them are what we call wetland species. But there's a handful that I've been showing you that we that are woodland species uh, native to shady understory. This is uh, not far from the Platte River, uh, just north of Cedar Bluffs and a place called Pahuka. And Pahuka to the Pawnee is where the world began. And so the landowner uh, took me out here and showed me this. And he said, it's this green uh, up until Thanksgiving time, like and beyond. He said, what is it? And I was like, boy, I'm not sure, um, but I'll find out. And I had Kay Cautis from uh, Prairie Legacy key it out for me as Longbeak Sedge. And we've been putting Longbeak Sedge on the map here at the Statewide Arboretum ever since. And get this, when I was out in Shadron, at Shadron State Park, what was in the understory underneath the Ponderosa Pines, right on the edge where they're not mowing? But this plant, Longbeak Sedge, so it grows from, from porter to border in Nebraska yet overlooked, underutilized. There's my long beak sedge meadow at my house. So this is this is an area along my side yard. Uh, back behind this shrub border is our backyard. So it's very private with the, with the plants we have here, but with the big tall trees, I have a lot of shade. The lawn always looked, you know, half dead and it, and it would bite a lot of weeds and I got tired of mowing it. So I did this sedge meadow instead. And now this area, is I would say around eight years old, maybe older, let's say a decade. And I haven't watered, uh, mowed, or raked it in, in th that whole time. Now you might say, so what, Bob? It's boring looking. Well, it's low maintenance. And that's what I'm after, something I don't have to mess with. But I also know my trees are happy growing in that condition, right? That's what I'm really after is making my trees healthy. Now, what I want to do uh, to jazz this up is I want to come in here and plug it with uh, things like woodland flocks, and um, um, wild columbine and some of the other wildflowers I'm going to be showing you in a sec. And then finally, the Texas sedge, which we started off the sedge talk. And there you see it again, used in various locales here. It's a very shady location, the Texas sedge. And it's a slow but sure runner too, like Pennsylvania. And here you see it in more of a sunny area. But again, an area where you don't want to mow, but yet it keeps the weeds out, right? Nice lawn alternative, wouldn't you say? And I'm telling you with this drought, you would not need a sprinkler system. So this is the grass of the future, in my opinion. 
All right, now let's talk about some, some woodland natives and American bellflower, the Campanula americana can kind of get a bad name. And if you have this plant, you know what I'm talking about. It can kind of not play nice and seed around all over the place. But I say, if your plants, if your landscape stuff with sedges, right, you don't have to worry about it seeding or it doesn't stand a chance, right? So you can eliminate some of these uh, so-called aggressive plants by simply swallowing up space. Meaning if you have open ground, they're going to take advantage of that. If you don't have open ground, you're going to get a seedling here and there, not everywhere. And American bellflower is just too beautiful of a flower anyway to not have in your landscape. And talk about tough. All right, we got a question. Uh, let's see, when switching from fescue to sedge, do you kill the fescue completely first? Yes, I would. And there's ways you can do that. You know, uh, you, you know, it's like, okay, yes, you can use Roundup and you can you can spray it with Roundup, really easily done. You can just plug the sedges right into that existing yard. You can also smother that fescue. You know, you can, you can uh, set your mower at its lowest setting and really scalp it. And then, you know, you could smother it with some cardboard and maybe throw on an inch of compost to hide that cardboard, let that deteriorate for a while. Or I've known people that will put cardboard down to smother the lawn, uh, put some wood chips on it, whatever, to hold it down. And then when they're drilling these plugs in, they'll get a two inch bit on a drill and just drill right into that cardboard and then plant your uh, plug right into it like that. Um, or you can just, uh, again, smother the fescue with compost if you can afford to uh, have the wherewithal to get the compost or, um, you know, you can raise your grade just slightly and your tree's not going to mind an inch or two of compost on it anyway. If you're converting, it doesn't hurt to convert to some good soil because it's going to take off faster for you than planting it in some compacted, nasty uh, clay that uh, if you think your soil's nasty, I would, I would give it some love is all I'm saying. Hopefully that answers your question. And then woodland flocks, right? The old standby, you know, good, good old fashioned plant. What I love about woodland flocks is eventually it naturalizes. You may start and purchase three plants, but if you're patient enough, they will keep reseeding year after year. And pretty soon you're going to get a nice patch of woodland flocks in your landscape. Very much uh, uh, a welcome addition to the landscape in spring. And yes, pollinators do like it. Another great one that's overlooked for shade is a prairie alum root. And the statewide arboretum is about the only place uh, Midwest natives probably offers it now, but uh, the prairie alum root is not common in nature. And so I think just us planting it for posterity alone is cool. The flowers, nothing loud and showy. You know, this is our native coral bells, folks. So if you know coral bells, they typically have uh, fiery red flowers. You can see why they're popular, the coral bells. But what I love about prairie alum root is the flowers aren't so loud and showy, but the foliage sure is, and it's very attractive foliage, and I've seen it turn nice shades of red in the fall. I don't think I got a pick of that, but it's a good pollinator plant. The bumblebees will hit it, and you can kind of see as, a, as you get a little closer to the flowers, they're not showy, but they're still interesting and still cool. Awesome plant, very long-lived. Uh, yeah, and there's more of your fall color on the plant, which I think is reason alone to grow it because it looks awesome in the fall. You got somebody on the chat. Uh, does the Texas sedge spread or repopulate on their own? Good question, Jane. Yeah, and I think we covered that. Is a, you know, I would say, Jane, if you're interested in it, Google it, um, look it up, and and learn more and and learn what others have to say about it, because it is a rhizominous spreader, but it certainly doesn't spread fast. I grew it at home, and what I learned about Texas sedge is in the shadier situation where it's not getting a whole lot of sun at all. It's going to take its sweet time getting going. The more sun it has, the faster it spreads. So Texas sedge is one of those that that baby will grow in full sun, but it'll also grow in full shade. It's just going to spread slower because of that lack of sunlight, if that makes sense. Just like a shrub, you know, expecting it to perform in full, like it does in full sun and full shade. It just doesn't happen, right? Okay, the celandine poppy, do you have this in your garden? Well, if you do, you know it's a winner, right? And celandine poppy is not native to Nebraska, but in my mind, it's close enough. It's also called woods poppy. It's native to kind of Southern Missouri into Arkansas and points South and East. Uh, it gets all the way East, I think to Georgia, but it um, anyway, it's completely hardy in Nebraska, easy to grow. I think it has attractive foliage. 
and the flowers, you can see where it gets its name. No, it's not a true poppy. It's not a poppy at all, but somebody thought the flower looked like a poppy, hence the name. And what you're seeing here, these are buds, but later on, I'll get these uh, seed pods and those seed pods will burst open. So if you're doing that landscape where you have large open areas, it's gonna do its best to naturalize for you and you're gonna get free plants out of it. And hopefully after about five years or so, you would start with three plants and maybe you'll have a dozen after five years. Maybe after 10 years, you're gonna have 30 of them. Again, depending how big your shade garden is, but a very attractive plant. And it blooms, the timing I really like is with this other woodland native that you need to put in the garden. Everybody should have Virginia bluebells, right? And if you have Virginia bluebells, you're nodding going, that's right. It's an ephemeral, so it comes up, blooms, and then goes dormant. But having it poke up out of other shade-loving woodland natives, uh, man, and the bees really love both of these species, the Mertensia, the uh, Virginia bluebells, as well as the Celandine poppy. But what a combo, huh, for spring, spring loudness. We don't need daffodils and tulips all the time, right? But just a, it's one of those plants where it just, like, it raises its hand and says, uh, hello, come and photograph me. Thank you very much. Ah, good question, Sherry. Uh, can sedges hold up to kids and dogs playing and trampling on them? You know, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. Um, I can't answer that per se. And all we can really do is try. I think you still reserve your lawn. You still re reserve your bluegrass, your fescue for those play areas. I think doing the sedges uh, for a garden type situation is the areas where, now I have a little dog, mind you, and my little dog doesn't hurt with her little trampling, but if you have big dogs and stuff and they have, you know, they pick their paths in the yard, right? If, uh, you know, I just don't have a whole lot of experience to say, is it continuous foot traffic versus periodic? They can certainly take periodic foot traffic, you know, like, you know, you're, you're walking through to get from, from point A to point B. But if they're not going to take that same abuse, I don't think at least as a uh, as a turf grass would. But that being said, we don't know until we try, right? And I think, um, and, and that's all you can do. You know, uh, it's a little bit more investing in a sedge meadow with because plugs cost coin compared to grass seed. But uh, they're a good, um, yeah, yeah. There we go. Follow the dog trails with mulch and sedge in between. Exactly. Yep. 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 Yeah, so it just work with your critter, right? And uh, and it's possible that way. All right, we'll get off the selenide poppy because I think it's just a gorgeous flower, right? Look at that thing, just so photogenic. And then there's wild columbine, right? Everybody, hopefully everybody knows the wild columbine. This should be in every woodland garden as well. It's a, It can be kind of short-lived, um, maybe two to three years, sometimes longer, but... Um, it's a plant that reseeds readily as well in the landscape and you can get free columbines and it's a good one to naturalize, much like the woodland flocks that I showed you before. Um, and this one you'll see native in Nebraska, certainly awesome, awesome plant. I love the foliage of columbine and then uh, the, the beautiful uh, uh, reddish uh, yellow flowers. And Solomon seal. So Solomon seal has these uh, beautiful uh, upturned flowers uh, or not upturned, but the downward uh, facing flowers and the, the bumblebees go crazy for these in the spring. They, they bloom early. And uh, this, you would think all the pollen is going to run out of this plant because it's upside down, but it's a buzz pollinated flower. The, the pollen can't be released until the bee actually buzzes it to release the pollen. And I can't remember what that term is called. Stephen, I know you're on. Share it with our listeners. The buzz pollination. Tomatoes need buzz pollination for example, in order for them to uh, pollinate. And there's the Solomon seal foliage. I think uh, it's another plant like hostas. I mean, hostas are popular. Everybody's got a hosta, but everybody should have Solomon seal. But Solomon seal is a spreader. It is going to spread and form a ground cover. Uh, but if you plant it like this person did, I call this in between a rock and a hard place, right? Has nowhere to go. Let it spread. Maybe it's between the sidewalk and your foundation and it's really shady and you can break up this cool texture with with maybe another flower in between or maybe a sedge, right? The fine texture of a sedge back in here where there's just these two little weeds. This could be a sedge back in here, right? Mix the two together. The Ah, sonication. Thank you, sir. Um, 
It, isn't that just a sexy word? Come on, Stephen. Sonication. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> we all will need more, a little more sonication in our life. All right, I'm seeing t-shirts. And then when the Solomon seal is emerging in the spring, I think it's really cool when it's emerging. And get this, the plant's edible. If you snap it off, if you've never done that, you have Solomon seal, you kind of snap it off at the base and, and eat the stem. I kid you not, it tastes like snow peas. Now, the seeds, though, those are not edible. So this is what the seeds look like, or the fruit, I should say, in the fall. And uh, I think the fruit's rather cool. And I wish I knew, I don't know off the top of my head, um, and this is Neil Ratzlaff that uh, took this picture. Uh, Neil has a great book on the uh, the flowers of Fontenelle Forest. I don't know what it's exactly titled. Somebody could help me out and share that. But it's a great reference guide for native woodland plants in Nebraska. And Solomon Seal can get some great fall color on the foliage too. And maybe you've seen this scene already where you go, man, Solomon Seal's got it all. It's cool when it's emerging. It's got cool flowers. It's got great summer foliage. And it's got great fall color. And the darn thing's edible. And get this, the root. What does that root remind you of? Joints, right? Kind of look like knee joints and ankle joints. Get this, look up health benefits of Solomon Seal. Now, first of all, Native Americans would dig up these roots and just snack on them. Good snack food. And I've eaten it before. It's sweet. Kind of like a, think of a jicama and texture. Now, granted, you're going to have to peel it or wash it well, whatever. But look up health benefits of Solomon seal and be prepared to walk down a rabbit hole because Solomon seal is a topical. As a friend uh, told me, it tightens what's loose or it, it loosens what's tight and tighten what's loose. So if you have sore muscles, tight muscles, and you make a salve using this and tincture it in uh, oil-based tincture, uh, and there's recipes online, there's YouTube videos, you guys just learn more about the Solomon seal because we've used it on our aching muscles and joints, especially during gardening season. And after my wife, Pat, applied the ointment on my sore back, you know how you can get it between the shoulder blades? It, within five minutes, it felt like a warm blanket on my back. Ah, thank you, thank you, Gail. Yes, that's it. Field Guide to Wildflowers by Roland Barth and Neil Ratzlaff. Do you have it, Gail? It's a great reference guide, I think. Um, good stuff. Thanks for sharing that. And then it's got a cousin, false Solomon seal. Um, they, the, the difference is, and people's like, well, I can't tell the difference. Sure you can, especially when it's blooming. Uh, because on false Solomon seal, the flower is only on the tips of the plant. Whereas in, in true Solomon seal, they're dangling down in the margins like I showed you earlier. And these will get hit by bees as well. Uh, this is actually my home landscape. And I can tell you, I, you see these rocks here and you see these rocks here. I planted it here because I knew how aggressive it was. And I said, good luck going underneath the rocks. Well, it's trying to. <laughs> uh, but again, I'm trying to plant it in areas where it rules that area. And uh, but I don't want you going any further in that area, if that makes sense. But a close up of the flowers, I think they're cool and they smell sweet. And it's maybe half the height of a true Solomon seal, maybe about a foot tall but just a nice foliage effect, in my opinion, in the shade garden. And I think the, the, the fruits that develop are just as cool as the flower, right? Isn't that cool? And that's what stage mine is at home right now, is in this fruiting stage. Creeping Jacob's Ladder. Wow, what a winner of a plant. So woefully looked and over underutilized. It, the, the, I think the name creeping scares people. It's not aggressively. I don't, in fact, I have not seen mine spread or or it, it remains a tight clump so i think the creeping came from it kind of is low growing it, it's, it's short um anyway i don't think it's an appropriate name for this beautiful little wildflower so i've had this in my landscape for many years it's it's tough as nails very drought tolerant goes great with any shade plant blooms i would say late a probably more like early may so it's an early spring bloomer and uh, an, an awesome plant. Close up of the foliage. I think the foliage is attractive even when it's not in bloom. And then this is one I actually had many years ago. This plant here you're seeing, that this is a woodland native, you guys, but I plant, had it out in full sun. Well, how did I get by? And here's a columbine in full sun too. Well, I just wanted to see, well, both of them did okay in the full sun. Indeed, what I had in here were prairie grasses. So the prairie grasses that haven't emerged yet 
come up and create part shade situations for these little dainty plants, right? So a big robust switchgrass planted next to this guy grows up next to it. By that time, this guy's kind of at this stage, semi-dormant, right? You know, it's it doesn't, I mean, sure, this guy still has flowers on it, but when it's done blooming, you just have foliage. Well, what if that foliage is protected from the, the hot south sun by a big switchgrass or a miscanthus or whatever the darn grass might be? Heck, it could be shaded by a little blue stem for that matter. Whatever, either, it could be prairie drop seed, you name it. So you can sneak in these little shade plants. Say you don't have much, much uh, uh, shade at home, but you want to, you know, you think this plant's awesome and I want to grow it. Uh, don't let that scare you. Just get creative with your microclimate uh, in in uh, growing a shade plant in full sun. But there's a close up of the flower. I think it's really cool, right? And then there's crested iris. Now, crested iris is not quite native to Nebraska. It's Missouri native, is as close as it gets and points uh, again east. It's a ground cover iris. So we're talking, it spreads rhizominously. You can, I know a dude that told me it's got a five by five foot patch. I've not seen it at his place yet, but uh, exquisite flowers in early spring and they're fleeting just like any iris. I mean, a thing might bloom for a week, right? But when it does bloom for a week, it's pretty darn showy and combines well with those other spring uh, bulbs out there. Uh, crested iris, I think prefers a half day of sun. If it's out in full sun, it's going to bake on you and not do well. It's, 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 I've killed them in full sun. But uh, the shade, in too much shade, they struggle too. So I think that half day shade is, is what you have to shoot for if you really want the crested iris. Uh, dwarf little guy, it's blooming maybe four inches high, you're seeing right there. But yeah, it forms a nice ground cover, as you can see. There it is in more of a woodland setting. There's with some daffodils, so you can kind of see the height difference. Early spring bloomer. Easy, easy plant. Is that not cool? Do you want one now? I see you shaking your head. Yes. Isn't that a cool iris? And it's a native iris. So you don't have to apologize for saying, well, I have mostly natives. Because you can have your iris and have it be native too. Okay. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites uh, for shade. This is a uh, wild geranium and this is it emerging in the spring. I think the foliage, the cut foliage is very attractive emerging in the spring. Um, this is Virginia behind it, but uh, that later on the, the close up of the flowers, um, there are the foliages with the flowers. And this is uh, oh foam flower. Um, oh, poo, what's the scientific name of foam flowers? It's escaping my brain. Foam flower is more of an Eastern native. Um, Tiarella, that's right. Uh, and Tiarella is kind of a wimp in the garden, in my opinion. It needs a little extra water here in Nebraska. Um, but wild columbine does not. This baby is very drop tolerant, very dry shade tolerant. And it's got one of the prettiest flowers, in my opinion, of any woodland native that we have. The literature will have you believe it seeds around too much. And that must be in southern gardens because I would welcome any seedling. I've maybe gotten one or two over the years. Um, but uh, I would certainly welcome more like 10 to 20. I'd want that baby all over my yard. And, and wild geranium is also called cranes bill. And I think a lot of people aren't sure why the heck that name gets from. But if you watch that plant going from flower here, uh, I don't think we have a splint, spent flower to show you. But as those flowers uh, fall off, this little central uh, beak, if you will, remains on where the flowers were, right? Here's where the flower was. And then that beak well, will go from green to black. And down here at the base of that, you see those little round things. Those are the actual seeds. So what happens is what, as that dries and turns black and dries, uh, it basically, and it can literally make a sound when you when you hear those seeds hit the leaves, when it, pew, it shoots them away from the plant. So how cool is that? So you have to time it right to collect the seed if you're too late the plants already pew, shot it out. You can see there's a little cup here to actually where the seed was uh, was inside that little disc or that cup and then shot it away from it. Pretty cool. But wild geranium, man, if you don't have it, put it on your wish list. And then our native jack in the pulpit, um, you know, also can be a spring uh, ephemeral, meaning it can go dormant during dry conditions. But if you have kind of moist shade, um, you know, it's, it's very drought tolerant, I found, but, uh, you know, to get it started, it needs very good organic soils. So if you're dealing with 
compacted, dry, not so good soils, you may not want to start with Jack in the Pulpit. It's one for rich organic soils, in my opinion, to really get it going. But what a winner of a plant at this cool flower in the spring. Uh, there's Jack inside its, his pulpit in there. And then later on in the fall, so the plant goes kind of dormant. And then later on, it shoots up this uh, seed pod, a uh, very bright red seed pod. Yes, you can actually grow asters in the shade. There's several species we're playing with, and I shouldn't say playing with, uh, promoting at the statewide arboretum as uh, overlooked and underutilized. One of them is the big leaf aster, and it's appropriately named, you guys, that most of the season, it's a ground cover with these leaves that don't even look like an aster. I kid you not, they can get six inches across. Uh, big leaf aster is appropriately named, but then later on in the fall in September, it sends up these elongated stalks up above that basal foliage, blooming it ultimately, eh, I would say around 30 inches. And you can see it's not loud as far as very floriferous, you know, they're kind of sparse in there, but still any flower blooming in shade in September is a welcome sight. And certainly the pollinators appreciate it too, because if you're dealing with a lot of shade, uh, it's a little tougher to support your pollinators, but there's what it looks like most of the year as a ground cover in the garden. I think it's attractive, very easy, and it's rhizominous, so it will spread, but not a fast run. You know, it's not going to overtake your, your yard quickly. It's a slow but sure run. And then another one is heart leaf aster. Heart leaf aster, I've seen native at Wilderness Park here outside of Lincoln, and uh, very easy, easy plant to grow, tough as nails. Um, I've seen it in full, planted in gardens in full sun, part shade and full shade, very versatile. The, the more sun it gets, the denser it's going to be and the more floriferous it's going to be. So kind of that happy medium where it's maybe getting morning sun and maybe a couple of hours of afternoon sun under a, a oak tree or something that's limbed up to 20 feet, you know, that type of thing. There you can kind of see it. Here's a tree trunk right there. So it's growing in the shade. Again, small flowers, but in profusion. And the pollinators love them. And then one I'm falling in love with is called Shorts Aster. And a uh, little blurry picture. Sorry about that. But this is a Shorts Aster, Aster Shorty Eye, also a native plant. And uh, uh, we've been selling this for a number of years now at the State Red Arboretum. So we're always, if I have my way, going to carry the big leaf, the shorts, and the heart leaf aster for you uh, you folks looking for something that will grow in the shade that's native. And there's a close-up of the flowers. And there you can see the native range of Hartley or Shorts Aster just makes into a few counties in Iowa and down the southeastern corner of Iowa, right across the border, right? Close enough. That might even be Wilbunsee State Park right there. Anyway, and then we have Zigzag Goldenrod, a, a shade-loving goldenrod. Uh, again, part shade is going to bloom better versus full shade, but I like the foliage of this plant. Doesn't really even look like a goldenrod, but yet it has this goldenrod type spike on it in September that the pollinators find. Will rabbits eat the big leaf aster? Good question, John. You know, with all that foliage on there, you would think so, right? And you know, I never had them at my landscape or heard others saying the rabbits love it type of thing. I can't answer that per se. You know, you could go online and look up uh, what others have to say about it, like um, maybe a nursery sells it and they say, you know, rabbits don't like it or something like that. I just can't answer that question. But I the, I had it for, at home landscape for years and never had rabbits eat it, but I never really have had too bad a rabbit problems, period, in my yard. Um, and I think it's because I offer them a diverse mix of plants. And I've always mostly had a dog and a cat. <laughs> and I think that helps keep those darn rabbits at bay, right? Okay. Yeah, so there's the uh, uh, zigzag goldenrod. Uh, cool plant, I think. Okay, so now if nobody has questions, let's see what I'm going to do. I need to go back. And I don't know um, how to go back other than this arrow. So... Close your eyes if this makes it dizzy. Oh man, I think what I'm gonna do. So Carissa, let's see, I want to back up my PowerPoint back to the milkweed section. And do you think I should just escape and then or sure. stop, stop sharing? Should I do you don't, stop? You don't have to stop sharing. You could just- um... Should I hit the arrows and be annoying? 
<laughs> or see what's what that saying? little the three dots at the bottom what does that do let's see arrow options screen you could do show presenter view and then i think it would let you roll through maybe not well i don't think slide 33 i think it's going to make me do this which is okay. annoying. so everybody close their eyes if you're going <laughs> dizzy you know fly through these fast Wee, everybody have in the meantime if anybody has any questions or in the chat or whatever feel free to mm -hmm. do that oh there we are wait no 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 we're not yet sorry my bad i did see a question the chat from a while ago when you were talking about sedge someone said does the texas sedge spread or repopulate on their own oh yeah yeah and we did kind of address that yes oh, okay. um, yep we talked about that now i have not seen it seed around i forgot to mention that um can you guys see we have a lot of plans to cover <laughs> i'll have you home by 10 i promise oh wait you're already home okay let's see bear with me i'm going to go back to we left off at milkweeds right mm -hmm. there we go now we're at milkweeds ah there we go yep okay doke perfect all right sorry about that didn't want to make you dizzy all right so the milkweeds right we all know about the milkweeds and how they're essential for monarch butterfly right i never thought milkweeds would become popular in the garden you know everybody wanted butterfly milkweed it seems like and they still do which is great um but you know they're not just for the monarch you know it's a great nectar source for for a lot of different bees uh beneficial insects really love the milkweed including these guys the oleander aphids and you probably have seen these on milkweeds maybe you've seen them on your swamp milkweed your butterfly milkweed the common milkweed these yellow aphids are called oleander aphids and they offer a sustainable source of honeydew uh, which is that sweet excrement that ants really like right so other critters uh predators are are feeding on those oleander aphids so they're good for biodiversity they're not going to kill your milkweed they're just going to kind of make it look a little unsightly to you, but don't be afraid of them. So here's oleander aphids being consumed by a serpent fly larvae. So uh, if you look at that close, that's what a serpent fly. So I don't think I have a picture of an adult that I put. I should have, but a serpent fly looks kind of like a house fly. Oh, no, wait, the serpent flies are different than that, Bob. Anyway. Google it if you want to see what a serpent fly looks like. But there's the larvae. So if you're spraying it or killing those oleander aphids, you're you're eliminating some really good horror monster movie going on uh, right on your milkweed plant, right? And then here's one caught by a convergent lady beetle. So again, they're they're helping the food supply of your uh, predatory insects, right? And then there's the tussock moth caterpillars there and uh, red milkweed beetles, and then they can get milkweed bugs, adults and nymphs. Uh, again, all uh, critters for, for bird food. Uh, the common milkweed is uh, one that we know, the, the typical Nebraska road ditch milkweed, the weedy one, if you will, the one that spreads by rhizomes that some people curse, some people love now. I used to curse them because we had to hoe them out of bean fields. Never thought the day would come where milkweed was in trouble and uh, that we would need to shore up milkweeds in the landscape. But when I tell people, don't go to the garden center looking to buy common milkweed. It does not like growing in containers. Just get some seed. That's all you need to do. Start it from seed and it'll go for you. But the flowers, man, if you've never stuck your nose in a blooming cluster of common milkweed, that's an uns a scent unlike any other. And I want you to know that when you see a bee on milkweed, know there's a pretty intricate thing going on uh, there in nature. The pollinization of a milkweed is very specialized. When the insects land on the flower, you see this little groove going back here. Their feet get stuck in that stigmatic slit down in this slit, which acts as a landing site. So then when the bee pulls their legs out, uh, the, 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 the parts stick to their feet, right? And then they, so the, the leg must pass through that slit. Otherwise, the flower is not going to get pollinated visible portion of the gland with two pollen masses attached so that then the pollen comes attached to their feet and then when they land on another one they shove that pollen back in there to give it so i think the common milkweed said well i'm smart i'm going to make these bees dance around this brown ball right so that the odds of them sticking their feet in this slit are bigger than say a butterfly milkweed 
for years I saw butterfly milkweed. Uh, there's the bud stage. There's the flower stage. And this is actually out in North Platte at Dale Lindgren's test gardens. He was a plant breeder in Nebraska. And Dale was after finding one that was more red because a lot of ones in the trade were more uh, like a pale orange. But the Nebraska version, the Nebraska native, um, tends to be more reddish orange like this, right? Um, so when you get them in the trade, it's hard to say where the seed came from, right? Um, hard to say. But anyway, the flowers tend to be more on the tops of the plant, the tips of the plants. So I, for years, I would see not very many seed heads uh, on the butterfly milkweed. And I'm like, what's the deal? It had lots of flowers. Why are there no seed pods? And then once I learned that specialized pollinization, I'm like, maybe they're pollinizer, maybe it's a specialist bee that can only fit its leg in the slit of a butterfly milkweed. Who knows? But you can still get seed pods on them. And, and we do, and we grow them from seed every year. This picture, you can see my little dog there in the background. She's given, kind of giving you scale of how big that butterfly milkweed is. This is my friend, Jill Cool's butterfly milkweed. I mean, whoa, that baby was two and a half by two and a half feet. And what I love about milkweeds is like, who folded your parachute when you go skydiving? Do you trust that person? Well, the milkweed does because each little parachute is folded just so, ever so neatly in there. And look at how it's lined up its seeds. Do you see where that pattern is repeated in nature? That's right, fish scales, right? Oh, and it's also repeated in bird feathers, right? So the, this, this, this uh, fractals, plants have been having much longer than humans, but lining themselves up like little soldiers. And then as the plant, the seeds dry, right? It becomes the, uh, the milkweed fluff that we all know that floats away, right? The best parachute ever. So the butterfly milkweed, pretty cool plant. And I love this picture because it shows a great combination for you. Uh, this plant you see here, the white, and a lot of people poo-poo white flowers, but notice what the white does to other flowers. It helps them stand out. So you got butterfly milkweed, Virginia mountain mint, and wild quinine in this picture. The wild quinine is this white guy here. And then the, uh, the plant you see right here with my cursor going that isn't in bloom yet, is the uh, Virginia mountain mint, but great native combination here in a little bitty six by six foot area. So you don't need wall to wall, a hundred foot space to do a prairie garden, right? You can just have a three by three foot corner and do a prairie garden with purple poppy mallow. Love this plant is a curb edger. It'll spill over the edge. It's what we call a weaver in the garden. So if you plant it in between tall plants, it'll kind of weave its way in between them and uh, kind of form a ground cover for you, if you will. The foliage emerging in the spring is very attractive in my opinion. And man, is it tough. Look at this beautiful soil it's growing in. I can't remember where this picture was taken. It was somewhere in Nebraska. Do you see all the other plants saying, dude, I'm not growing in that crap. You go right ahead. And you can see with that root there, like, I mean, a huge thick root, like a parsnip. Uh, that's a water storage organ is what you're seeing, right? So it's storing water in here. So in times of drought, it might go dormant up here, but the plants holding that water in here for when the rains return or for next spring, right? And when hopefully the rains return. But what an awesome plant for spilling over retaining walls and whatnot. Is that not pretty? I think the better name for purple poppy mallow would be wine cups. That's what the settlers called it because it looks like a chalet, uh, chalet, what do we call it? A little wine glass type thing. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Anyway, uh, cool, cool plant. Here it is in kind of a, uh, this is a, what we call a hell strip uh, in between a parking lot and a sidewalk. That's always the hottest, driest, sunniest area. What plants can grow in there besides having to mow it and, and you know, put a sprinkler system in there and mow it once a week. Look what we could do to our parking lot fringes, right? That we aren't currently doing. And this is so easy to take care of. Uh, you just have to get off your mower. A couple other examples of it in the landscape. I see we got a couple questions. Ah, thanks, Stephen. Rabbits are not eating my big leaf aster. They did nibble on the zigzag a bit, but your zigzag shrugged its shoulders and said, whatever, right? I got this. Thanks, Stephen. All right, let's see in the chat. Can I plant the butterfly milkweed now or is fall better? Well, Judy, I think uh, you probably know the answer as far as you, as depends on you being diligent and watering it, right? 
That being said, butterfly milkweed is a heat lover, right? Um, oh, thanks, Beth. The aphids secretions attract flies. Are you saying that's a bad thing or a good thing? I think that's a good thing, whatever. <laughs> flies are beneficial too. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, Judy, I'd still do it, um, you know, because they love the heat so much. You know, you just have to make sure you, you know, you don't forget to water them because you have, even though they have a tremendous root system, you still have to establish it. Um, if you're going to plant it in the fall, I would want its root system to get established a little bit. So I would say, you know, late August, early September at the latest for a butterfly milkweed. That being said, knowing me, I would push it till around October 1 if I had to. So, but yeah, I would go ahead and plant it. The thing with butterfly milkweed, a lot of us have killed butterfly milkweeds over the years because when you're planting it in early May, say around Mother's Day, in nature, the plant has hardly even emerged yet. So you're planting it in soil where the soil temperature is not right. And so you plant it and then you water it and it's not growing. So you water it again. And again, that dumb butterfly milkweed's not growing. Well, it's not growing because it's uh, the soil temp's not there. It's like, like trying to shove a tomato in the ground when it's too early, right? Think of it that way. Yes, thank you, Amanda. Hoverflies are pollinators, amen. And we have hoverflies hovering in our back patio every night. It's fun to watch them. And uh, my Pat wanted to spray them because she thought they were annoying. And I said, they're not hurting a thing. They're just staking their territory. And it's fun to watch them, watch them dive bomb each other. Yeah, hoverflies, they're one of my faves. It's a, it's a mimicking fly, you guys. It looks like a, hunt, a bee. Um, it mimics the look of a bee, so you leave it alone. But uh, yet it's a fly because it only has two wings rather than four, which a bee has, right? So let's move on to Rattlesnake Master. Uh, this is a, a plant in my yard, one of my favorites. Um, long lived, um, gosh, it's, it's been there for a long time. Full sun is best. If you have it in part shade, it's gonna struggle. All these plants I'm showing you now are full sun, if you can. If you can. Some are a little more shade tolerant, like Savannah type species, and I'll, I'll talk about those as we go along. But I love the uh, rattlesnake master's foliage, even when it's not in bloom. I think it's a cool plant. It's kind of a gray green, right? And if you look at it, the scientific name is Eryngium yucca folium. So somebody thought the foliage uh, looks like a yucca. And uh, I would kind of agree, wouldn't you? And uh, but I love that blue green foliage, very attractive. And it has these little, if you look closely, little hairy spines that look like they'd be sharp and pokey. They're not, it's very soft. You can rub your hand right up on it. But uh, one thing I want you to notice in this slide is the bee on the flower head. So one little tiny flower, do you see where my cursor is and where that red arrow is? That is one flower the whole head isn't one flower the head is a composite we call it so these composite species are the most important group of plants for pollinators because the plant has fit literally dozens and dozens and dozens of flowers on one head so take that one head you guys and now visualize that one little tiny flower and then step back and say look at how many heads there are just in this one picture right we're not gonna to bother to count them, but I'd venture to guess there's probably 50 heads in that picture. Each head may be containing 200 flowers. So you do the math and you're like, ah, that's why these bees clamor over certain plants because the flower is not stupid. The flower is saying, I'm gonna not open and just be done blooming after three days. The pollinator may not have emerged yet. The pollinator, it might be a rainy day, they may not be active, right? On a rainy day, it might be drizzly and overcast, whatever, where the bees aren't as active. Well, if I bloom just in one or two days, I, I, I'm not going to take advantage of my pollinator. So new flowers will open every day uh, on plants like this. And this pattern that you're seeing, do you see, oh, Stephen, help me out again. There's a, this pattern is called something, and you'll see this pattern repeated again and again as I'm going through the flowers and showing you this fractal uh, that you're seeing is nature's beautiful fractal. And I know Stephen, he's going to be on that. Uh, let's see, let's move on. But the one, one pollinator you will see all over the rattlesnake master that just goes crazy for them is the black wasps called the mud dauber. And the mud daubers scare the heck out of people. Why? Because they're like uh, jet engine, jet, jet fighters, man. They, they can fly like any other wasp and they'll love to show that off to you. And they don't have much of a stinger. 
So they do that to kind of, uh, you know, deter you, right? To, to make you uh, afraid of them. They're, they're ten yeah. Oh, Fibonacci and Steve, uh, Bob, there we go, Fibonacci. Uh, you guys can see that in the question and answer that that Fibonacci sequence is repeated again and again in nature. And Bob, I'm, I apologize if I'm uh, not pronouncing it correctly. I'm I'm not an Italian. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but thanks for pointing that out, Mister Mister Fuhrer. Love it, love it. Okay, let's see. Uh, and on to the next slide. Now, again, here you see a white flower, and people complain, "Oh, it's just white. It's kind of boring." But now, look at it in combination with other things. You're seeing here. This is blue giant hyssop, and Agastashi, the blue giant hyssop. Uh, you are probably more familiar with anise hyssop. Uh, very similar. Pollinator magnet. Okay, and then you got rattlesnake master, pollinator magnet. And then you have uh, the uh, pale purple coneflower, pollinator magnet, all three together. What a lovely combo, right? Then there's rattlesnake master with sweet coneflower. This is a Rudbeckia species, uh, Rudbeckia subtomentosa. It's a taller Rudbeckia that blooms maybe eh, a couple, three weeks later than our typical black eyed Susan. We've been selling sweet coneflower at the statewide arboretum for gosh, probably five years now, most people walk right past it. And I'm like, man, if you knew how cool this plant was, it's a taller guy, more like four to five feet. And, and uh, man, just tough as nails, long lived, um, easy plant to grow. And then wild quinine, you saw me show a picture of that earlier. And uh, that was with the combination of butterfly milkweed. I uh, love wild quinine's foliage. I don't know if I'm going to have a good picture of its foliage here, but that white flower is really cool. It almost looks like cotton balls stuck on the end of the of the cool flowering stems, right? And really nice in combination. Here you see it with a, a Tennessee coneflower here and some little blue stem back behind here. This is one of the alliums here, more than likely one called Summer Beauty. Um, allium or the allium millennium is a very uh, popular allium right now, or this could be prairie allium, and 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 I'm hoping it is. The prairie allium is uh, allium stellatum, and uh, it's not wild garlic. It's it's prairie onion, and that's the one you need to be shooting for if you're if you're after native, is uh, go for the prairie onion or allium stellatum or stellatum simply means star-like and the flower is very star-like. And then here you see in the foreground, uh, this is a stockies, uh, a, a cousin of the lambs here. But what I love about wild quinine, because it's white, you can combine it with a lot of different things and really use that white to frame the flowers of the show-offs like balloon flower. Balloon flower is not native, but this is a good example of, well, there's a, a native bee, a bumblebee, and a non-native plant. So yes, native bees will take advantage and are perfectly fine taking the nectar of non-native plants. I think we need less concrete. We need less asphalt. We need less rooftops. Uh, we need less corn. We need less soybeans. So don't chastise folks for not going strictly native. We just need more gardeners, right? Uh, period. And whatever it takes to get them interested in gardening, whether it's a hosta or a balloon flower, I'm all for it. So here you see wild quinine with uh, thick spike gay feather here, the, the liatris back here. And then uh, this is a, a wild bee balm growing here and then little blue stem in the foreground. Great gardening combination. And then it is one of these keystone species. And what we mean by that is it, it invites a myriad of different species. Uh, it'll invite uh, flies, it'll invite wasps, it'll invite butterflies, it'll invite bees. And why do they clamor over it? So you've seen a picture of the flower, right? Right there. It doesn't look like much. That's just, This is a flower where my cursor is in full bloom. So now look at a close-up of it. So now you see that little cotton ball. You see that little speck right there? That, that, that ring around here? That is the little flower. So that's one flower, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You get the idea. At least a dozen flowers in that ring. Where this is pointing, those little white dot there, that's a flower bud. So that's it's opened around the ring of this pattern, that, that same pattern that's repeated again and again. It starts at the bottom and works its way up. 
that's why you see these composite flowers bloom for such a long period of time, because until the plant completely goes through that cycle all the way up to the tip, it's going to keep looking showy for us humans, you see. And so again, it's guaranteeing repeat visitors every day when they come to see if a new tiny little flower has opened today. Tiny flowers satisfy daily visits. Isn't that cool? What about Canada milk vetch? Does anybody have this in their landscape? Chime in if you do, because I love this plant. I've heard it described as a Japanese pagoda type flower look. I would I'd kind of squint my eyes and agree with that. It's a cool flower, very unique. Um, the It's a legume, so it fixes nitrogen. The seed pods that develop later on. So here you see when Black-Eyed Susan is in bloom, this plant's already done blooming and developing these really cool seed pods. And here it actually is out in a prairie in bloom with, oh man, I can't quite tell what that is. Maybe that's showy tick tree foil or something like that. But here it is in a native prairie, uh, a prairie restoration done by Prairie Plains Resource Institute outside of Aurora. Yeah, and here's another, uh, this picture from Chris Helzer from the Nature Conservancy. They're doing great work there uh, in the Platte River Basin doing prairie restorations. And he has lots of good things to say about Canada milk vetch and its uh, its role in shoring up our nation's biodiversity. Important plant to pollinators there. You see a big bumblebee on it right there. Heck, is that a Japanese beetle? It probably is. Anyway, I think it's got cool foliage too, right? Neat plant, overlooked and underutilized. All right, we got another comment. Oh, wow, Stephen, he has a, he has a five foot tall Canada milk batch. Man, you got that baby fat and happy being five feet tall. I've never seen that. In a dry prairie that we were showing uh, in that other pick, I mean, uh, lots of competition. But I think the seed pods are cool when they're, when they're green like this. And then later on, uh, when they're dry, um, Indians called it a rattle pod. So if you uh, cut it off and shake it, uh, it kind of rattles. All right, now on to the mountain mints, one of my favorite group of plants. This plant kind of can scare people sometimes because it has the name mint in it. But if you have rabbit problems, you have deer problems, and you're looking for something that can grow uh, and not be bothered by them, things that have scented foliage like bee balms, uh, alliums, the onions, the, the mints and the mountain mints, the oregano's, the thyme, all those things that have scented foliage uh, tend to not be eaten at all by deer and rabbits. So that's where you can start off in your landscape. So when they visit your landscape, seeing what you did for them, you can say, there's nothing for you here. Move on. Uh, they don't eat prairie grasses. They don't eat prairie sedges. So those are good places to start for you that are just uh, at wit's end with rabbits. Um, mountain mint species are going to bring in pollinating insects you've never seen before. I love that quote. Moreover, you almost never see these pollinators on other flowers. It's like there's a whole world of specialist pollinating insects that will find this plant. And I challenge you when it's in bloom and attracting all those pollinators, how many different species can you see on that daily visit? Maybe you're going out uh, to stroll your garden, seeing what's up and you see, oh, the mountain mint's in bloom and uh, give it a week, it being in bloom, they'll discover it and see just a myriad of different pollinators that clamor for this. And get this, mountain mint species have medicinal properties to them. Rosemary, bees clamor over. Oregano, mint, lavender, thyme, solidago, all the goldenrods, all the asters. All these plants have medicinal properties. I'm convinced that the essential oils that are within that nectar and within that pollen are also being transmitted to the insect, just like they would be to humans through herbalism. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons we have problems with our bees now. Um, certainly those that raise the farming bee, the honeybee. I don't think that's not even a honeybee, but anyway, um, you know, you're well aware of bee problems, right? Uh, this is a honeybee here. Um, you can tell by that leg there, but uh, you know, the highs overwintering, you know, susceptible to uh, the vireo mite and, and, and disease problems, you know, they're, they're having a tough time with overwintering. Is anybody planting these so-called medicinal herbs around their beehives so the bees get not only a diverse diet, but although also those uh, um, um, flavonoids, those, those different compounds that you see uh, within the nectar and pollen. I think 
I don't think there's really any research that's been doing that. And I'm always in the ear of the UNLB lab saying somebody's got to research this because I've heard of things like common hyssop um, apiary folks that raise bees in, in Europe have long uh, rubbed the inside of their hive with common hyssop, which is Hysopus officinalis, uh, a well-known medicinal herb. They rub the inside of their hive to keep the hive healthy over winter. Go figure. Okay, so you're looking at Virginia Mountain, which makes, makes a fine tea, by the way. Very easy plant to grow, topped with these white flowers, again, that the, that the critters just go crazy for. And there's there's usually five species we carry at the statewide arboretum. This is one of my favorites, the toothed mountain mint. Um, it's rich, this one is rich in, in in pulagona, and that is a natural insect repellent. It can be rubbed on clothes to deter chiggers, gnats, and ticks. Go figure. And leaf eating insects avoid the mountain mints as well as deer and rabbits. So uh, later on, this plant is green throughout the season, and then later on in late summer, it gets these, it forms these bracts that hold the flowers. These and, and what you're seeing, these little round doubts, those are flower buds, right? The, the flowers is tiny little guy you see here on the edges. That's again only around the outside ring, right? So the flowers are going to work all the way up this and get visited by a myriad of insects. It's one of those so-called keystone species, again, because it invites uh, wasps, it invites flies, it invites bees, it invites butterflies, all of the above, right? They all take advantage of the toothed mountain mint. All right, I'm going to check the time here, 744. All right, we're doing not too bad. Um, we will go another 15 minutes. Let's see if there's a question here. Okay, we're good with the questions. So I'm gonna keep plowing through these, you guys. Um, all right, the black-eyed Susans, remember that pattern I keep talking about? Did you have anything, Carissa, we're good? Nope, you're good. All right, so if you notice this cone, so look down below here, you see these little dots here? Those are, each one of those dots is a flower, you guys. So the, the rays, the yellow parts you see, these are what we call rays. And that's that's basically, so the bee says, come on over, right? But once a bee gets there, if you've ever observed a bee working on a cone, they're kind of dancing around the outside edge. Maybe you've watched them for five seconds to see they'll move around and then they'll fly to another one, do the ring around, and they'll just keep checking to see who's open. And the, all this stuff below here, these are spent flowers. But on top of this bud, each one of those little balls you see, those are flower buds. And you'll see it again and again. And if you remember, anything at all from tonight. You don't even have to remember any sort of Black Eyed Susan. I just remember that because I think it's really a, a cool thing to, to watch in the garden. Like, oh, there's that pattern repeated again. And there they are dancing around that outside ring of a composite. Oh, anyway, showy Black Eyed Susan, very popular in the landscape, right? Um, easy plant to grow. That's why you see it. Some people don't like it because they think it's too aggressive and it seeds around too much. Well, sure, give it open space and it'll do that. But if you don't have open ground, you might get a seedling here and there. You're not going to get thousands of seedlings. But if you have open ground, it's going to take advantage of you and seed in. But but who would who would care about Black Eyed Susie, uh, you know, standing on a corner, right? Let her stand on a corner. She's too pretty. Yeah, awesome plant, one of my faves. And there's that sweet cone flower I was telling you before. Flowers are a little larger, it's a little taller plant. And there it is, you see goldenrod blooming in the background. So it's a little later bloomer than the uh, the showy black-eyed Susan I was just showing you. And again, and uh, there's the pattern repeated. There's the buds versus the open flowers. Notice the bees not in this part of the flower. He's around that one ring. And I I don't know, I've never timed it, does a new ring bloom every day? I would suspect it's pretty darn close to every day, if not every other day. Okay, hoary verveins, often regarded as a weed by ranchers. Um, anybody raising cows say it's just a weed, and you'll see it be aggressive on overgrazed pastures. But in the garden, I think it's very well behaved, um, especially if there's lots of plants around it, like you see in this picture. You might get a seedling here or there. But man, one of the longest blooming perennials I know of in the garden, and yet it's often regarded as a lowly weed. And pollinators go crazy for this plant, especially butterflies. There, I think, is a fritillary uh, on that one uh, vervain there. 
but is that not gorgeous? Yet you'll never see them at the garden center, folks. This thing is regarded as a weed because cows don't eat it. So if you're raising cows, anything's a weed that the cows don't eat, you see, right? <laughs> if you think about it. And it's got a cousin called blue vervain, equally as pretty, uh, but blue vervain, you're more likely to see along wet areas, waterways, whereas hoary vervain says, give me the dry, give me the compacted soil, give me the nasty soil, and I can take it. Um, awesome plants, the vervains. It's just not common in the garden center, but if you know where one's blooming out in nature, I would just say go back and visit it and harvest some of the seed and just scatter it somewhere in an open spot in your garden. And then uh, then you'll go get your own hoary vervain going or blue vervain. Love that plant. Never thought I'd say that. <laughs> All right, purple prairie clover. My, oh my, what a winner. Okay, remember the pattern. Here's the pattern repeated again on the cone. This guy decided to do a little different. It kind of forms a skirt of flowers around the base of that cone, right? And well, the cone flower is really no different. It's just not an elongated cone, right? What we've been looking at are rounded cones. So this one's more elongated. But again, those, those composite flowers are still starting at the base of it and working their way up. So what you see is the skirt right here and then all that color down below here, this is spent flowers. So no, nothing for the bee anymore, but everything above it is still in bud. So more flowers to come. I think that's pretty cool. So there you kind of see a close up of the flowers and there again, the ring. And that's where you'll see the bees dancing around that ring. Here's another ring, spent flowers, buds up above. You see that pattern again, repeated, same pattern you saw in the cone flower, same pattern you saw in Rubecchia, on and on and on. Another keystone species for show. I think it's one of the best. Has nice seed heads and even after it's blooming, in my opinion. All right, the gray-headed coneflower. There's your pattern, right? I repeat it again, and there are the little yellow dots. And now you know when you look at this, what are those little yellow dots again? Individual flowers. That's right. You nailed it. And then look at below here. So look at this. This one hasn't even started blooming yet, right? You guys see all these buds back here? I haven't even started. Whereas this guy that's bloomed the longest, all of these are spent flowers. And then the ring is way up here. So it's almost out of life, right? This individual flower, or I shouldn't say individual flower, <laughs> one, one stem. But And then this one's only about a third of the way up, a third of the way up. So you can see long bloom time because of that. And I think it's one of the... Uh, Oh, the, the postcard prairie plants, you know, like dancing in the slightest breeze, gorgeous thing. Yes, it can seed around on open ground. Some people don't like it seeding around so much. I say get a life. Um, it's too awesome of a plant to worry about it seeding around too much in your yard. And it's another keystone species. It's a very important pollinator plant. It's a plant that they will clamor over again. Um, I mean, and there again, you see every one of these images where are the bees, but working that row, right? Working the row that's in bloom. And it even becomes finch food too. Uh, we think of the yellow goldfinch is only hitting the uh, uh, echinaceas, the purple cone flowers, but they also love the retibitus too, the uh, um, upright prairie coneflower and the gray-headed coneflowers. All right, now we move on to wild senna. This is a late summer bloomer, almost fall now. And uh, I think it has very unique foliage. This is another legume that will fix nitrogen for your soil. Easy, easy, easy plant to grow. Doesn't need anything from you. Very drought tolerant, maybe four feet uh, or taller. I've seen it certainly four feet, but it has very unique flowers with these black anthers, which I think are cool. But it's another one of those buzz pollinated flowers and only can be pollinated by the, the, um, the bumblebee. Yeah, there we go. There's that sonication word again is, uh, such as solitary bees to release pollen. Pollination involves vibration. It's called buzz pollination. Honeybees cannot perform buzz pollination. That's why if you see tomatoes in a greenhouse, they will release bumblebees in there because the bumblebee is the only thing that will pollinate those tomatoes. And then senna, the, the wild senna that I'm showing you is the host plant for the beautiful cloudless sulfur butterfly. And 
If you've never seen a cloudless sulfur, this is not the same cabbage yellows that you see on your cabbage plants. The cloudless sulfur is a big boy. I mean, we're talking three inches across, beautiful butterfly. And there's the larvae of it that you might see on the wild senna. Cool plant. Um, yeah, it, it, it visits that, that produce pollen. There's higher protein ratio than, than, uh, than any other plant. Wild senna was a favorite of bumblebees amongst the plants used in a, in a study at Penn State. So it's another one of those where if you're after helping pollinators, put senna on your to-do list. Because uh, I think even when it's not in bloom, this is what it's looking like in the landscape right now. I think it's attractive. Almost looks like a honey locust that's seeded in, right? <laughs> but not quite. And there's a whole row of it here in Lincoln at the uh, food forest here at uh, 40th and uh, uh, Old Cheney here in Lincoln. Nice grouping of it there. And then later on in the fall, it gets these great seed pods on it that I think are awesome. Let's see. Let me look in the chat. Oh, can't see flower pick after a second person appeared. I'm not sure what you mean, Christy. Uh, can't see flower pick after second person appeared. Is that, am I missing something there? Well, you, you explain what you mean in that chat there. I'm going to move on, but I think they got cool seed heads and yes, this plant will seed around too. Um, but, uh, Hey, I like free plants. Let it seed around. Wild bee balm, keystone species, top 10 pollinator plant. Gotta have it. Uh, put this on your wish list. Wild bee balm is an August bloomer, heat of summer. It can take that heat of summer. Here you see a clear wing moth taking advantage of the nectar. Uh, a lot of different critters will take advantage of its nectar and love it and get this. If you Google health benefits of wild bee balm, you'll see that it is, uh, oh, I like that, Stephen. The bees use senna in the morning and it seems to be done in the afternoon. Kind of like... Uh, the, the scent is like, all right, I'm shutting down. I'm just letting you be active, kind of like we see with the mullion. Uh, the verbascum species will do that as well. And the uh, primrose, the anotheras will do that as well. Um, you know, I'd like to, you know, tap the plant's shoulder and say, so dude, why do you do that? What, you know, other plants don't do that. Why do you think it's an advantage? Oh, Stephen, ethnobiology, let's, let's, or, you know, evolutionary biology, let's figure this out. Anyway, uh, awesome plant. Uh, the wild bee balm. Love its foliage, love its flower. It's really got it all. And then after it's done blooming, I think it's got cool little seed pods. And you see those little tubes? So it's easier to tell from here how many individual flowers there are. But each one of these long tubes you guys see is an individual flower. And it's hard to tell from that pick, but there's buds down here too, Heidi. But once you get to the seed pod stage, each one of these tubes you see, that was actually an individual flower. So you can see it's another composite that literally stuffs dozens and dozens of flowers on one head, if that makes sense to you. All right, let me check the time. I think we will end on the sizzling silphiums uh, because they deserve more love in life. Um, the silphiums. Uh, okay, yeah, you're checking in on Christy. Okay, anyway, sizzling silphiums. Now, if you don't know silphiums, Aldo Leopold in his book, Sand County Almanac, called them a century plant because they literally live a century. And it's another one of these composites. So you see the flowers, you see the uh, bees working the outside ring. Um, kind of hard to tell in this pick. I think we'll have another one, but you see the individual flowers, right? Each individual flower has that black anthers coming out. So you could actually sit here and count just on this one ring is probably what, two dozen flowers maybe? And there's a number of different species of silphiums native to Nebraska. One is the rosin weed. Um, love the rosin weed. And again, it's a bee magnet. Um, overlooked, underutilized plant because somebody decided not to give it a sexy name, right? Rosin weed. I mean, come on, who wants that? I think we need to form a club that hereby officially changes the common name of plants. <laughs> uh, who wants to join? Anyway, we got compass plant is another uh, silphium. And awesome granddaddy of the prairie, uh, beautiful flowers, sunflower-like flowers. It's not a true sunflower, you guys. The silphiums bloom about a month before the sunflowers do in August, typically. 
and uh, late August, uh, early mid to late August, that type of thing. But it has this cool foliage that one leaf will get up to be two feet tall or more and huge leaves. And if you rub them, they feel like sandpaper, very coarse to the touch. And you would cover yourself with sandpaper too if you lived on a prairie and you didn't want critters coming to eat you. Uh, it keeps the kind of the critters at bay having that coarse texture on the leaf, but very unusual, interesting leaf. And the leaves tend to orient themselves north-south. That's why it's called compass plant because if you didn't have a compass on you and you're out hiking around, you could look at the compass plant and, and know which, which direction's north. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then another cousin is the cup plant. So, so compass plant you'll see on the open dry prairies, whereas cup plant you'll tend to see near waterways and wet areas. Uh, gorgeous plant. Again, sunflower like uh, flower on it. Uh, but the cup plant gets the, the leaves where they all clasp around the stem. They completely clasp around it. So after a rain, you can, it's kind of hard to tell, but that's water standing in that stem. So you can imagine birds and insects taking advantage of that water and drinking out of that cup, if you will. And very unique square stems on this silphium as well. Tall baby, you're looking at a seven foot tall plant right there. So I like space takers as much as anything. And it's got a pretty flower to boot. Okay, well then. We are sitting at 758, uh, and uh, Carissa, I'm going to look to see if we have, okay, Christy figured it out, hopefully not too late. <laughs> All right, now if anybody has any last minute questions or comments on some of the plants, you know, never be afraid to chime in, if we're doing these in the future, chime in and say, man, you guys need to get this plant. I have it and love it, whatever. I think the more the merrier, um, you know, talking about the benefits of a certain plant. And uh, because you guys, there's one tenth of 1% of the tall grass prairie remaining. We're it, uh, us gardeners are it trying to, you know, bring nature home as Doug Tallamy says. And Tallamy focuses on trees, but prairie plants are important. This is our neck of the woods, right? This is our, our, our thing to hang our hat on because you can't count on wild areas to harbor these plants anymore. You know, think about any wild area you go to, you know, usually that wild area is mowed for tent camping, right? <laughs> they don't have much prairie around it. And uh, folks like the Game and Parks, the Nature Conservancy, they're trying to change that, right? And coming full circle when they're looking at more of their properties as a uh, an ecological diversity rather than something that's just used to hunt on. You know what I mean? They're trying to create habitat uh, for pollinators as much as they are now for pheasants, which is just a, a really welcome thing compared to maybe back in the 70s, right? When it was all about upland game birds. And I understand why we do that. Uh, so, all right, Marlene. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, hot and dry here in Beatrice. Oh, no doubt. Uh, it's just annoying. In fact, I was kind of crabby with the hot and dry weather yesterday, I must admit. Thank you, Jean. I hope you enjoyed it. Real quick, I um, realized that I forgot to launch the survey. So sorry ah. to everyone to take one more of your minute tonight, but um, I just launched that. It should only take about a minute to fill out. So if you do have the time, please just do that real quick. Um, like I said earlier, it helps us know what people, what types of events people want to see going forward. So we would appreciate that. Um, and then, yeah, just thank you so much, Bob, for all that interesting information as always. And I just really love your use of your own pictures and your slides. I think that helps people, you know, it makes it more real for people to see, oh, this is what it looks like, you know, even right. if the photos are a little older. I mean, like you said, one was like right. 15 years old. It didn't yeah, look right. Like that, but yeah, it's it's nice I, kind of like when I see that, I'm like, oh, that's right. I forgot I put that in there. No, yeah. I, but I do have to admit some of them I pull off the web too, you know, and I know some people are worried about copywriting and stuff. And I'm like, if you, you know, you may have a watermark on, I'm, I'm about, you know, this is not, this is like a you know, it's a PowerPoint. It's not like I'm publishing some book or something. Share that information, right? And and these people that are willing to wait for that perfect B picture, you know, I don't have two hours to sit there with my high definition camera, right? To take a picture of a bee working right. over a flower. So I 
I applaud those people that do that. And there's lots of cool images. And, and that's what I say, you know, with everybody having smartphones and the internet now, you know, I, if you seeing a bee clamor over a flower, what I mean by clamor is they, they seem to be like in a hurry, right? There's so much nectar and pollen. They're like, oh, they know what's coming. The frost is right. And no, they're after the medicine. I'm convinced. Look up if it has medicinal benefits because most of them do. Right. Yeah. Um, it looks like we've gotten most of those polls in. So thank you guys for filling that out. Like I said, sorry that I launched that so late, but um, yeah, like Bob mentioned, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but it looks like we've gotten everyone's. Um, so thanks to everyone for the questions and like I said, Bob, I just really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us tonight about this interesting topic. I'm glad we got to hear the rest of it. I know you just have so much information for us, so I'm glad we got enough time tonight to cover most of it. I know you have a little more, but I think yeah. we got most of it. Yeah, I, I, oh yeah, always, right? <laughs> I'll never be done. Oh, you know, and just real quickly, Chris, uh, Beverly mm -hmm. asked, would it work to convert one mulched flower bed into native plants and sedges and they would not spread into, yes. And that's the thing, Beverly, is a lot of people think these native plants are going to spread everywhere. They like, some of them like open ground and whatnot. They're easy to control. No harder than any other weed you've pulled in the garden over the years, right? You pulled dandelions, you pulled foxtail, you grow, pulled crabgrass, right? No different. Start small and keep adding to it every year because when you start small, Beverly, you're going to learn, well, shoot, that was easy to take care of. Um, I'm just going to double it in size next year. Oh, and then I'm going to double it after that, right? And then you're going to learn pretty soon my lawn is gone. So start small and, uh, you know, and, and create that space. So when you get your plants, you're not walking around going, ooh, I'm not ready for these right? Give, give that garden bed some love. And oftentimes I create the bed in the fall and plant in the spring is what I like to do. And I'll let it sit idle all winter. Yes, Stephen, we're having a plant sale. Thanks for reminding me that we are having a plant sale this Friday, our last of the, uh, well, the spring season as we move into summer, right? Tomorrow's the first day of summer, everyone. And so we're having our last plant sale this Friday from 1230 to 430 here on uh, East Campus. Love to see you there. And then um, then we won't start up sales again until probably late August. So, oh yeah. And then Shram State Park, we're going to be having some plants there too. They're having, I think they're calling it Pollinator Party out at uh, Shram State Park. Uh, my cohort, Toby Burnham, will be out there. So stop by and say hi to him at Shram as well. They're having a cool event, a Pollinator Party this Saturday. And I don't know the time off the top of my head. I have to, I'm giving a tour if you want to join us out at uh, Prairie Pines uh, Prairie or Prairie Pines Nature Preserve out on 112th and Adams. I'm giving a, a, a guided tour of their land there on Saturday from 10 until noon. So join us out there at Prairie Pines. You can go to Prairie Pines, just type in Prairie Pines on their website to find that or just show up out there at 112th and Adams around 10 o'clock and we'll hike around and uh, I'm gonna order beautiful weather and a thunderstorm. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and speaking of prairie pines we actually have an event there with conservation nebraska next week we have a forest bathing event um, oh yes that's right same day same time next tuesday at 6 30 so hopefully people can make it but yeah um okay well i'm seeing that that's all the questions is that right I think so. So oh, hi, Heidi. How you doing? All right. I'm seeing some seeing some comments now. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, lots of thank yous, lots of great presentations. So again, thank you, Bob, for taking the time out of your night to speak with us, share all of your knowledge with us. And thank you to everyone who took the time out of their day to be here tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar will be uploaded to our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel. So feel free to um, check that out and check out our Facebook page as well for more upcoming events. And cool, cool. Um, like you said earlier about accessing your presentations, yeah, we will get those out to you. Sorry that we haven't gotten the last one out to you guys yet, but we will get on that. So that one, should be out to you as soon as possible. 
One final plug, Chris, uh, tune in to How's It Growing every Wednesday. I always do a, I always forget to do a shameless plug for a radio show I co-host on KZUM, Lincoln's local radio station. If you're outside of Lincoln, it's a, it's a community radio station, so it's like 25-mile radius, right? But anybody could tune in online at kzum.org. Uh, you can type it in now and probably catch some great music at 8.07 on a Tuesday night. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I do a gardening show called How's It Growing every Wednesday from 11 till noon. There's archive shows out there, too, available. So I uh, invite you to tune in, listen, and we're going to be talking about uh, uh, healing herbs tomorrow and focusing on a couple, three of them with uh, an herbalist named Barbara Salvatore. So uh, uh, tune in and check it out. Sweet. Well, thank you so much, Bob, and thanks to everyone who came tonight and yeah, we hope to see you guys again soon and have a good rest of your night. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Bob. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.